Hello, my name is Beth Wyman, Commodore of the Inland Lake Yachting Association. I'd like to welcome ILYA viewers and guests. This project was made possible by an education grant from the ILYA Foundation and support from Sales Inc. I'd like to welcome back our hosts, Stephanie Robel and Maggie Shea, and very special guest, Dave Ullman, also known as the Speedmaster. <laughs> we hope you enjoy this final webinar of the Robel Shea series. Visit idlya.org or salesing.com to view them again and again. Now, on with the show. Thank you, Beth, and thank you everyone for tuning in tonight. We're really excited to have Dave here with us tonight um, for our, our final talk with you all on boat speed. Um, he's been a huge, huge part of um, helping us build our speed in the 49er, and um, we're just we're happy to have him here to share some of what we've learned with him and well hey we're gonna run through some um some basic like sales setup uh and mass setup concepts just to, to make sure we're all on the same page about um what we think are the tools to get faster and then we're gonna kind of pass over the discussion to dave and let you guys open the floor for discussion um and if everyone's being shy then steph and i have some thought-provoking questions we can ask we'll quiz you guys okay so um my, is my screen sharing okay stuff yep you're good all right cool so we break down um how we think about our boat speed tools uh we break it down into like the equipment so how we set the boat up the boat the sails with the sail shape and rig settings um that's one big area and the second big area is really the technique and that's how you sail the boat and how you use your sail controls how you sheet and drive and how you the relationship of those two um, and how well you transition from puff to lulls etc and, and the different modes that you use so i'm going to start talking about um equipment and some basic uh sail shape concepts and then i'm pass it off to steph to talk about technique and then like we said it'll be dave's floor so um this might be a review for some of you guys um and maybe not for others but basically uh in order to you know, talk about sail shape, we should, we should cover how you generate lift. And um, if we look at this diagram on the bottom left, um, we're looking aerial view, bird's eye view of a sail. So mass is here and the back end is the leech to the sail here. And we're imagining that air is, you know, imagine for the purposes of the next few slides that we are sailing a close hauled course and the driver is driving straight for the most part and your sails trimmed properly. That's going to allow us to just really talk about what's happening with the sail shape and how that affects your speed and, and the setup of it. Um, so just imagine straight, close all course, sails trimmed well, things are good. Happy days, nice flat water on Lake Beulah, sun is shining, everyone's happy and sailing. That's yeah. <laughs> all right, sweet. So that's what we got. So, all right, so the air goes around the sail. And as it travels around the backside, it's got a longer distance to travel, right, because it's the curved section. <clears throat> it's, so it's going to be moving faster along this area and it's got a shorter distance travel on this side of it. And so that difference in uh, speed that the molecules are going, I guess, would be the really rudimentary. And I, I do apologize if there are any rocket scientists or astrophysicists on this call that I'm butchering all of these mm -hmm. concepts, but we're just going for the basic top level here. So, uh, but basically the difference um, that's created, it creates this high pressure on one side, low pressure on the other side, and that generates a lifting force. Okay, so if we overlay this sail on a boat on the top right, now we're looking down aerial view again, and let's add in the little red thing here is our keel or our center board, maybe it's your lee board, um, but that's basically your lateral resistance. Imagine we're hiking as hard as we can, and all those forces generate uh, this forward motion, which is kind of the direction that we end up sailing. Okay, so. Um, I'm going to, we're going to breeze through a few slides and then pause for questions at the kind of the end of this concept. Um, okay, basically the objective of, sail, of sailing, or of trimming our sails is to present the sail in the most efficient position for the wind, so where the airflow is not it, it disrupted and it, and it stays attached to the sail as much as you want. So if the sail's luffing or if it's stalled, then you're either trimmed in too much or too loose, right? So. A properly trimmed sail is the most efficient position for the sail where the airflow is uninterrupted and it remains attached. Okay, so we talk about sail trim in terms of angle of attack, and that really is just um, the angle that you're presenting the sail relative to the true wind direction. And so if you were to ease out your sail, and again, we're just traveling straight, ease out your sail, that's increasing your angle of attack. Trim in your sail, that's decreasing your angle of attack. Um, and the way, I mean, 
the one one of your biggest indicators to know how the airflow is going around your sail is telltales. So just look at those um, as sort of an indication of whether the, the air is flowing or it's stalled. And so these these three telltales on the left, or on the right, sorry. Um, the one in the middle would tell you that airflow is uninterrupted. You know, those aren't stalled, they're flowing freely, happy days, all's good. That's kind of what we want to achieve. Um, and then the one at the top, top and the bottom would show you that either your sales too loose or you're stalling, but basically you're lo there's a, yeah, you're losing flow at some point. And it, this isn't something you really want to like live and die by because if you put telltales all over your, if you plaster them all over your entire sale, you're naturally gonna get some areas that stall. Um, so it's pretty critical to have your telltales in the right place. I think there's some good resources on salesing actually that talk about the specific scowls and, and where the telltales should be placed and which ones you should look at. Um, and sometimes it's different in light air and, and breezier, but basically just want us to think about telltales as an indication of how the wind is flowing over the sail. Okay, so what makes a sail powerful? Um, Sail, the power in a sail comes from the fullness or the depth of the sail, which we call the camber. So more depth equals more power, but I just wanted to note that we're not always necessarily looking for more power because we quickly get into this overpowered state. And so power doesn't always just mean speed. You know, there's a sweet spot of the amount of power you want to look for in the boat for that given condition, for how much you can hike, for the wave state, et cetera. So, Anyhow, um, we'll talk about that more in a second, but basically this is your camber line here, the curved line, and the distance, well, okay, so we've got this camber line, which is curved line, this is your mass, uh, and this is your leech. So it's set, set up the same as the previous diagrams we were looking at. You draw this imaginary line from luff to leech, or from you know mast to leech, that's exactly horizontal, and then we measure the distance, that's called your cord length. We measure the distance between your cord length and the sail, and at its, at its furthest part is your draft, which we'll get into in the next slide. But basically, this is your camber line, and the curvature of that line is, um, is, your, is like the, the, the depth and the fullness, the shape of your sail. Um, oftentimes, it's measured in uh, percentage. It's like a ratio between the camber and the cord length, and it's a percentage. So these diagrams down here are examples from salesing. Um, one on the left, we've got, it's 9.5, so that's a flatter sail. And this one here has got more depth, 16.7. So basically more depth equals more power and the camber line and the camber is what we talk about with the, the curvature of the sail. Okay, so we measure depth by identifying the draft. And the draft is like the deepest part of the sail. So it's when, it, it's, if we draw that camber line, where is it the farthest from the, the cord length? Um, I like these diagrams because the, actually on your boats, I noticed uh, on Facebook there are a lot of draft stripes on your on your sails, and so that can kind of give you a visualization of how much depth there is and where it is. But we just um, the amount of depth in the sail influences how straight or how twisty the leech is going to be, and so the the deeper the sail is, the more power it's going to give you, and the better it is for pointing. So the deep, think about it like a deeper sail will give you a straighter leech, whereas a flatter sail will give you a twisted leech. Um, you know, in big breeze, we want to flatten the sails out, depower them. That basically lets the top of the sail twist off. That's a more depowered sail. In lighter air or when you're looking to point, you want a deeper, more full, a fuller sail, straight leech, gives you more power. Okay, and then where you put that depth in the sail, you can think about where the depth goes in terms of like, fore and aft, so how close it is, is it to the mast versus how close is it to the leech or the bow or the stern. Um, you can also think about the different like layers, like slices of a cake almost, you know, that you're layering on top. But for the purposes of the conversation right now, let's just talk about it in terms of like forward and aft. Okay, so <clears throat> draft forward is in this diagram here. And again, these little circles are our masts. <laughs> Aerial view of the sail, so this is a mast. This is a draft forward, which would be the deepest part of the sail is closer to the mass, as opposed to draft aft, when the deeper, deepest part of the sail is like behind that, that uh, center line. Um, and we have a lot of ways to uh, manipulate that. But again, as just a review, I know I'm gonna keep repeating this. <laughs> draft forward is depowered, gives you a twisted leech, 
better for that fast forward mode, better for when you're depowering. Draft aft is much more powered up, straighter leech, better for pointing. Okay, and <clears throat> this is just a, kind of another way to represent the same information, but these, these that ones on top are from the last slide, basically draft aft, when the deepest part is in the back half of the sail, will give you less twist, so a more closed leech, more power, more pointing, <clears throat> and draft forward will give you more twist. It'll basically draft forward, will open up the top of your leech and twist it off, less power, more of a depowered state. Okay, um, in junior sailing, I remember hearing this a million times, so I just wanted to, to touch on this analogy. Everyone always says, well, sails just work just like wings, just like an airplane wing. And for the longest time, I was like, I have no idea what that means. But um, I did, these are stolen diagrams from explainthatstuff.com, really scientific source here. But um, it's pretty basic. Basically, uh, just like we were talking about earlier, the air splits at the front of the wing, goes around the wing, and it generate the difference in pressure. High, it wants to go from high to low, generates an upward force and lift on the plane. So if we look at these different wings, um, these, I, I overlaid some pink lines, oops, sorry, just so we could look at and kind of compare it as like the camber that we're talking about in previous sales. Um, the top diagram would be max efficiency. When you're at the altitude you wanna go, you're trying to cruise, trying to be efficient, you're not necessarily climbing, um, and you're trying to maybe conserve gas, I'm not sure, but it, this, is, this is basically your cruising the look of cruising. And then when we want more lift for taking off, the airplane wings extend. Actually, they extend in length and they curve a little bit. So you can see here the wing flaps come out and down a little bit, which increases the camber. That's a little more lift than the top diagram. And then the maximum lift, uh, which I think is interesting, it's when you're landing and um, because you're going slow, you need to kind of like artificially create that lift. Um, maximum lift and the most amount of drag to also slow you down because as you're landing, you're trying to stop eventually, right? So this is your maximum lift and your high drag when your flaps are out and down. So I thought those, looking at it that way, kind of looks a lot like a sail to me and, and it started to make a little more sense. Um, okay, any questions about lift? I just want to pause here before we kind of go on to the rig stuff, but I know they... You should go to work for me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think we need it's to really give you a virtual round of applause. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Very, very good. Do we have anything in the Q and A or chat, or we got oh, some yeah. chat? Um, just some some commentary, for, which has been that you're doing a great job teaching. <laughs> oh. Okay, thanks, guys. Okay, cool. So, all right, now that everyone knows everything there is to know about sail shape, that's great. We're going to move on to rig settings, <laughs> and these are, I mean. Every rig, like learning the different intricacies of the rig takes a long time and you kind of need to study where the attachment points are, what happens when you tighten shrouds, what happens when you loosen them. It's taken Steph and I six years, I've been in the boat for six years, Steph's been in the boat for four years, we still learn new stuff every month, you know, about how the rig behaves um, and so on. But to basically, to really sum it up, you either want to, if you bend the mass more, you're going to have a flatter sail because the, the sail is gonna to stretch to kind of fill that space. You have a flatter sail. More mass bend equals flatter sail, more of a twisted leech. Whereas if you have a straight sail, you're gonna have a fuller, deeper sail. I'm sorry, straight mast is gonna be a fuller or deeper sail. Now, why I was saying the shroud tension is really kind of specific each boat is because um, even on our boat, for example, you can achieve mast bend by either increasing shroud tension to induce the bend to increase the shroud tension and it for and it, you know you pull the tip down and it has to go somewhere so the mass bends or you decrease shroud tension like our lowers spin them off to allow the mass to bend so if you want to get more mass bend you can either it depends on your boat and the and where the shrouds attach basically but you can either increase shroud tension to force the mass to bend or you can decrease shroud tension to allow it to bend um, and then how to prevent mass bend if you want a straight sail you can either decrease shroud tension to let it stand up straight, or you can increase shroud tension to prevent bending. So it also kind of depends exactly what the natural state of your rig is and its tendency to bend. Um, but I also, another plug for sails inc. There are a lot of really great resources and specific tuning guides for all the different kinds of scouts that you guys sail. And so I highly recommend checking that out. But 
let's move forward in the conversation kind of understanding that a straight mast is going to give us a fuller, deeper sail. It's going to be more powerful and a bent mast is going to be flatter and a twistier leech. Why is it called gross, Maggie? We just had a question in the chat. Gross oh, I love it. Thanks, Jude. So when we talk about adjustments, we've got, we talk about like gross adjustments, which is like a big scale, like a macro adjustment. This is, this is um, having a greater impact on the overall sail shape would be a gross change versus your fine tune, which are your little controls that we're gonna talk about later. So gross, it's not in like a ew, gross, yucky sense. It gross is like big picture adjustments. How you set your mast up shapes your sail a lot. Thank you for paying close attention there. Um, okay, and then the other gross adjustment, you know, the other big tool we're gonna talk about is where you put your mast in space relative to vertical, whether you tip it forward or tip it back, and that's called your rake. Um, we measure rake by taking, you literally take a tape measure from the stern, the transom of your boat, all the way up to the tippy top of the rig, and you add more rake. It goes further forward, you take rake out, goes further back. Um, Again, really great rake uh, resources and sales thing, and I highly recommend that. But um, we found that the rake of the sail has a really big impact on the helm and how, how the boat feels to stuff. Uh, when you rake forward, the boat basically wants to head down. And when you rake back, the boat wants to head up. Uh, and I dug this, I really like this Opti diagram. But Steph, Steph is the resident Opti queen, so I'll let you talk about that one. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think the picture does a lot of the explaining and I like Maggie how we were talking earlier it's, it's similar to when you're sailing a windsurfer um, similar thing if you rake forward the boat wants to head down you rake back the boat wants to head up and I think it's all about where that um, that center of effort is placed in, re in relation to the center of lateral resistance so I think those are yeah definitely some cool diagrams and what do you feel on the helm when we when you need to make a correction in the rake <laughs> Um, just a matter of if we have windward or leeward helm, like if I'm having to pull a lot or if I'm having to push a lot. So windward helm would be the boat wants to round up and you have to pull the tiller to correct it. Yeah. And then leeward helm is when the boat wants to head down and you have to push the tiller to correct it. Yeah. Cool, cool. cool. All right. Um, I'll, question I'll that. That. Does, does mass rate also affect sail efficiency? Absolutely. And there's, there's another little point to uh, kind of a hidden thing in rake. Um, keel boats, you don't rake in the breeze, but planing boats or boats with uh, movable foils up and down or forward and aft. The more you rake in the breeze, the more the angle of attack on the jib and main is less right angles to the wind and wants to stall less. And the optimum in rake in, let's say, a 470 FD, something like that, is to try to get the head stay and the mast above the head stay to be a straight line, all in the same plane. So the wind sees both sails as one, not as two. And Dave, one time you explained to me that the most efficient position would be like 90 degrees. 90 degrees, the wind attacking the foil from 90 degrees is the most efficient, but has the most tendency to stall. So it's the hardest to sail to keep in the right plane or, you know, not stalling. So in light air, you want to get as close to, uh, in, again, non keel boat, uh, to right angle foils in front. Uh, jib and main, but they get very easy to stall and very hard to sail. And the same with the blade. If you have a blade that comes up and down, let's say a 470, in light air you want it straight up and straight, uh, up in right angles to the water, or even slightly forward of that. And as the breeze comes up, you want to keep pulling it back. You know, boats you're sailing, you can't do that, so you can just go up and down. Uh, basically having less board or more board, but anything that you can uh, adjust the angle, you want it as straight up, straight uh, right angles to the water as possible and wide air and keep moving it back so it doesn't stall. And like 470, you actually move it forward uh, uh, vertical so it doesn't stall so the water is going up the foil instead of, um, you know, instead of down. Thing is you want 
the same with the wind and you want the foil, you want the water to, to go across it uh, to keep it from stalling rather than right angles into it. Cool. All right, well, I think if there are no more questions, I'm gonna pass it over to Steph to talk about how to sail the boat properly. Right, Steph? You never <laughs> saw. <laughs> Never, never. Um, well, something that's pretty fun about our boat is that, it, um, you know, to sail it with the right angle of keel, it requires a lot of balance between us and then also a lot of balance between the main and jib. Um, so we we're constantly talking about, are the sails matched? Do they have a similar leech setup? Do they have a similar um, depth profile? Um, do, the, do the sails match? Because as soon as they don't match, they're gonna, we're going to feel different things on the helm. Um, but as we say here on this slide, in order to accurately assess the, the helm, we need to make sure the angle of heel is correct. Because um, if we're really, really heel to leeward, um, the helm is going to feel different or if we're heel to windward. Um, so making sure the angle of heel is right for um, the breeze that we're in. Um, and then we need to listen to the feedback on the helm. So what's the boat telling you? So um, like we said earlier, if we um, have windward helm in, in order to keep the boat going in a straight course, um, the boat is trying to round up, or the boat's trying to round up and in order to keep going in a straight course, we have to keep pulling the tiller. So that's our windward helm and then leeward helm is vice versa. So if we had windward helm, um, the boat would be rounding into the wind and we would maybe ask ourselves, is the mainsail too powerful or is the jib not powered up enough? Um, those are kind of some things you need to think about when um, thinking about the balance. And then, um, you know, kind of just, if you don't have a jib to balance you out, you might have to dive a little bit more into depowering with your boards um, just because you don't have that like push and pull kind of concept with the, with the main and jib. Think of helm as drag. Uh, yep. So in most boats, you want an absolute minimum of helm, maybe one or degrees of weather helm, keep you honest driving the boat. But helm is not lift, helm is drag. Yeah. A concept that uh, is often uh, mislabeled or not properly presented. Cool. And uh, Al points out we can also drop the traveler in a single sailboat to reduce the helm. Good call. Nice. Cool. So kind of moving on to, you know, we just did this whole rig and, um, um, you know, sail, explaining sail setup and everything. And now we're kind of getting more into the technique of everything and, and how you actually sail the boat. So we have those gross adjustments with the rig. Um, and now we're going to get more into the sail controls um, with the fine tune adjustments. And then the other part of that is the actual sheeting and um, driving technique, which involves um, transitions and moding and communication between um, the helm and the crew. Um, before that, do we want to answer any of these questions? Al Hager just asked, would it be better to sail upwind with zero weather helm? I taking that? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If you are uh, an A1 driver, yes. Or or very, very slight weather helm. Uh, maybe one degree, one and a half degrees. But um, if you're a really good driver and you have a high performance uh, boat, yes, you want zero helm. Yeah, I think as the helm, if you don't have anything, it's it's really hard to to feel. I definitely like a little bit of of helm just to to have some grip and something to drive with, drive against. Yeah, it keeps you honest. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So yeah, for how we how we actually sail the boat, we have the sail controls um, and then the sheeting and driving techniques. So. Um, getting into our sail controls, that's our more of our fine tune. Um, and I totally, I love this diagram from Sailsing. They had, like Maggie said, they really had a lot of helpful tools for helping us put this whole presentation together. Um, and kind of the three big things that you'll see on, on every boat is, is your Vang, your Cunningham, and your outhaul. So here we can see how the Vang um, 
flattens the sail and, and pulls down on the leech. Um, and it also bends the mast to, to flatten the sail as well. Um, and then you have the Cunningham, which moves the draft forward, that deepest part of the sail forward, and it opens the leech, the, the top part of the leech. Um, and then you have your outhaul, which controls the foot of the sail and the return in the bottom part of the leech. So um, kind of your three major factors that you see on, on every boat. And then as Al said earlier, we have the traveler, which helps a lot with balance of the boat, um, backstay in, in other boats. Um, you know, I think the traveler is a really awesome um, tool for if you just need to quickly depower, you can just bump the traveler down real quick. And it's, it's really nice, especially if you're on a super puffy, shifty day. Um, and then the backstay flattens the sail by bending the mast and opening the top of the leech. Um, and then in the Opti, for any of the Opti sailors out there, um, we have the preventer, which is that little line that you put twists on, um, which moves the, the boom up and down. So that's actually gonna move your, your draft fore and aft. And then, yeah, Lucas, Opti sailor. <laughs> um, okay. And then you have your sprit, which moves the leech. So the more sprit tension you have on, the tighter your leech is going to be, and the less um, sprit tension you have on, the looser your leech is going to be. Um, and in, when you're overpowered or in really light air, you would want that leech a little bit softer. Um, and then when you're in max power conditions, you want that leech a little bit tighter, which I guess transitions me into our next topic, <laughs> um, is kind of talking about wind conditions and simplifying our wind ranges. So um, different people have different terms for all this and different um, conditions, but um, we like to to talk about it more in these terms rather than wind speed because you know there's definitely days when you'll go out and you'll think it's blowing 12 knots but someone else thinks it's blowing 15 knots and that that little bit of difference in wind speed can be a huge difference in how you sail the boat so um, we refer to these four terms um, underpowered full powered depowering and overpowered um, and really using we, we use our body weight as a pretty big sign in our boat um, to help us understand you know which wind range we're in here and then um, the amount of sheet amount of main sheet that we're playing the amount of controls that we have on help us identify this so our first um, our first uh, sorry I'm off on the slide here sorry <laughs> our first um, zone as you could say is underpowered um, and your your goal here is to really focus on building speed and then taking that speed into height and kind of almost having like a scalloping going on upwind. Um, your weight placement is quite far forward, trying to attach the bow to the water, as you can see in that picture, um, and then quite active weight movement. Your weight is moving with all the little changes in pressure. Um, and as far as sail setup goes, um, still having your, your draft pretty far aft, um, keeping the sail deeper to, to start generating more power, um, and then a big thing here is actually your main sheet tension. So in in the puffs, you would you would trim on your main sheet a little bit um, for more power, and then you can push your body weight against that. Um, and then in the lulls, you would want to open up to the leech a little bit and twist um, for more power. So just a little bit of change in main sheet can go a really long way in these conditions, and a little bit of change in, in body weight can go a really long way as well. One thing to think about in light air is if you're sailing in five knots of wind and you get a knot of pressure increase, you just increase 20% the amount of wind. If you're sailing in 15 knots and you get a knot more, it's insignificant to change. So you have to be really aware in light air of trying to be really efficient with your weight and trim because the conditions are changing up and down hugely with you know major gains to be made yeah yeah and we certainly feel that in our bow with how sensitive it is to the angle of heel and um, how much weight we're pushing on the trapeze very touchy conditions yes very touchy okay, full focus um, our next condition which is probably my favorite condition um, is full power it's when you're just trying to get everything out of the boat all the power that you can handle um, out of the boat. So max hiking, um, keeping the boat really flat. You're not easing any of the sheets yet. Your boat, your, your main sheet is in its max trim position. Your sails are really powered up and you're hiking really hard against it. Um, you'd have a, a deep foot here. 
um, with an eased out haul, trying to get a little bit of return in the bottom quarter of your main, um, like right under, right where the Kilroy sticker is on our main sale in that photo. Um, and then you're just having a little bit of bang on to control the leech, but not to flatten the sail. So really aiming for zero twist on the leech of the main sail here. Um, very, very straight and then just trimming really tight for power. Um, Maggie really loves it. It feels good on her forearm. <laughs> oh, you just have to pull so hard and then hold it there. <laughs> it's no fun. Cool. And then as we get up the wind range, we start getting into that, that depowering mode. When you're, you're starting to ease the sheets a little bit, you're starting to pull your controls on a bit more, um, starting to put a little bit more twist into the sails. Um, and a really big goal here is just balancing the boat um, with the main sheet. So you're, you're fully hiking, you've got a bunch of power in the boat, and you're trying to figure out how to keep the boat balanced um, based on the wind that's coming at you. So um, another thing here is you consider moving your weight back to get the bow out of the water a bit more, um, especially in our boat since we're planing. Um, and then as far as your sail setup goes, you're, you're starting to twist things off. Your, your foot depth kind of depends on the sea state. Um, as you can see in this photo, we're in um, some pretty big waves. So we have maybe a little bit fuller bottom part of the sail and maybe air on a bit more twisty if we're quite overpowered. Um, so using the Cunningham is more of a tool there um, to help move the draft forward and depower the sail. Um, and again, bang to flatten the sail and then and bang sheeting so that when you're when you ease the boom, when you ease the main sheet, the boom isn't going straight up, the boom's going out sideways. Um, and then we get into our overpowered or maybe some would say like super gnarly conditions um, where balance again is super important. Um, main and jib balance and then um, heel the boat balance as well. Um, and then really racing in these conditions comes down to good boat handling as well. Um, so those who can really like tack and jive the boat really well is they're going to make huge gains in these conditions. Um, but that being said, um, especially if you're sailing in wavy conditions, having weight together so you're not, um, so the boat isn't pitching that much, um, you can put your weight together and um, really try to just be aggressive, like fore and aft, based on the on the wave that's coming at you. Um, and this is kind of where you start going on like max controls. Your your bang is on quite hard. Your cunno is your Cunningham is on as hard as you can go to get a nice twist in the sail um, and a nice flat foot. Um, for less power. Um, and this is also where we would start talking about um, our board height, like Dave was talking about earlier. Um, if we're getting quite overpowered, we'd start bringing the board up um, some more just to have to carry less power in the boat. Yeah, we actually get to a funny a point in this boat at like 18 or 19 knots where uh, the, the main sail is just totally washed out and just is not even working. And I say to Steph, next puff is on you and she just has to drive up and basically sail just on the jib because the, the main is almost inverted, it's totally luffing. And then when the breeze dies down a little bit more, then I can trim back in. Um, but yeah, we're totally max controlled on everything in, in that circumstance. It's kind of easy. The, the, the pressure on the sheet goes really light, actually, and then it's all, your, it's all up to you. Your dog gets a lot easier. <laughs> yeah, exactly. For the second. rudder gets a lot heavier for me. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Cool. And then, um, you know, a major part of this, like we talked about for lake sailors, is, is the transitions. Um, and these are kind of the, the questions that I like to ask myself um, when we're coming into a transition time. Um, am I entering a puff or lull? I think that's your first question. Um, and how long will it last? Um, how much power do I have in the boat right now? And do I need to make a big change or a small change? So. If you're coming into a lull that's going to last for a while, you're going to be, um, you know, you're going to make that change for a long time. Whereas if it's just like a, a temporary lull, maybe you're not changing your gears as aggressively. You're just changing one or two things, you know, your your weight and a little bit of power in the traveler or something, for example. Um, so I think this is these are some really helpful questions to ask, and you know, I just think that you can't be accurate like you can only become more and more accurate with your transitions. And, you know, that's something that we've talked about um, in our team is something that really separates the girls who are really good at the top of the fleet um, is they're really good at their transitions. They can, they're just so precise. They're sailing the boat perfectly um, throughout all the changes going on. And sometimes we'll actually set up in like the worst 
possible sailing area of a venue to get the maximum amount of uh, transitions. And um, yeah, both team members need to be on board with that decision because <laughs> you're sitting there going, well, we could be sailing on that nice open yeah. bay, you know, mm -hmm. but instead you want to set up right next to shore and really work on those transitions. And we spend so much time doing it. Um, hey, Steph, uh, we have a question about Vang. So maybe yeah. we want to go back before we go into the next concept. Cool. It seemed, um, and from Al, he asked, can you guys talk about how Vang tension affects leech tension upwind? Does it depend on max, mass flexibility? Um, that's yeah. a great question. Yes, it does. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so that's something that we do um, with our equipment is we bend test our mass um, to understand how soft or, or stiff they would be. Um, so if it's a really soft mass, the bang is going to make a, a change quite effectively. Um, whereas if it's a stiff mass, you're going to have to bang quite hard in order to have an impact on flattening the sail out. Um, and in the same vein, the, the, um, the amount of tensions that we carry on our lower shrouds affect how soon the vang engages. So on our boat, um, the vang like pushes into the bottom part of the mast as well and pushes it forward and it causes it to kind of bow forward there and flatten out the sail. And so if the mat, if the blowers are really loose or the mast is really soft, as soon when I start pulling Vang on, the bottom part of the mast is gonna go forward and it's gonna flatten out this bottom part of the sail quite quickly. Um, what's and so that's that's one thing you have to have enough lower tension on that your vang actually works that you get past you don't flatten out the bottom sail completely before you start having an effect on the leech so the vang also really affects the mid leech on our boat like if we lose too much vang if, if you have, if you don't have enough vang on then like about halfway up the sail just is too open um and so on our boat the vang affects the leech and the flatness of the bottom of the sail and and your question about uh mast flexibility is, is very relevant yes it depends a lot on that yeah, and mass flexibilities will you know for every class there's a tuning guide uh usually made by a sail maker but doesn't have to be but mass flexibility will change that tuning guide slightly how you set the rig up uh, because regardless of how stiff or soft your mast you want it to do a certain thing and you may have to change your rig slightly to make a uh, stiff mast correspond with a medium mast or a soft mast. So it takes slight tuning differences. We found that with the girls for sure, as we go through different masts, the setup is slightly different. It's not, you're not locked into numbers yep. in setup. Yeah. Cool. Al, does that answer the question or maybe let us know if, if you have more questions in the chat about that Vang question. I think some of the other questions we can save till the end. Yeah. So cool. Thanks for rewinding just a little bit. Um, and on that Vang note, actually, so when we are in the fully powered and overpowered, okay, so Mac, the Vang is coming on, coming on, coming on, and then we do get to a point when it's like 20 plus knots or something that we might ease Vang a little more because we're just totally, completely overpowered and we want more twist. Um, so yeah, sorry if I, was, if I was repeating that from earlier. <laughs> oh, no, no, that's a good point. Um, but that's like survival stuff. That's fun. Okay. Um, we're on to moding. Yeah. Um, but I know this is a little bit of a repeat, repeat slide, but I, I really like this slide. Um, and it helps me really visualize um, how the sail shape needs to be in order to execute different modes. Um, and for those of us, for those of you who joined us for previous chats, um, we talked a lot about this on our upwind tactics. So you can use your moding um, for tactics, but you can also use it um, for like holding a lane um, around the course. So um, just some rules of thumb for if you're if you're trying to take height, ease your cunning ham, tighten your bang, tighten your sheets, traveler up. Um, those are all some steps that you can take. Um, again, like Maggie said, you want to just focus on that draft aft tighter leech. Um, and then if you're trying to go forward, uh, or sorry, if you're trying to go into a low mode, like you're trying to tactically get over the front of a pack um, to position yourself between them and the mark, or um, you're leading out to a corner like we talked about, you can, you can go into that low mode and go Cunningham on. Um, that's a really powerful tool for that. Ease your bang a little bit, 
um, maybe use your sheets just to just to click like a little little bit um, hike really hard and then you can also put that traveler down um, those are all some steps that you can take to, to just transition into different modes also think why why you want different modes uh, if you're sailing into a header you want to go fast forward if you're sailing into a lift you want to go high Regardless we learned that's of, called the Wally method from Al actually on a call a couple weeks yeah. ago. We didn't know yeah. it was called that. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. right. Cool. Um, well, I'm sure you guys have heard enough of Maggie and I talking for <laughs> the last six weeks. <laughs> so we're going to officially pass it over to Dave to talk a little bit about just how you can get faster with your program. Um, you can see Dave here with Annie Hager and Brianna as they were getting ready for the Olympics in Rio. Um, and he certainly made them a really, really fast team on the water and he's helped us a lot. So we're excited for him to share a bit about his process um, and how you guys can bring it into your programs for the summer. It's my connection, you know, last seven years with your lake. <laughs> I mean, the two teams, I feel like it's- uh, But you still haven't been too. to the lake. I still haven't been there. Yeah, no, I gotta to get- change there. that. <laughs> but I certainly feel a connection to it. Um, so getting fast is, is not an easy process. Um, when we were preparing for the Olympics in, in before 1980, we did a lot of sailing on our own and it's really difficult to develop boat speed when you're all by yourself. It means, uh, developing, uh, a golden touch. So you know exactly what the boat is doing. And that's quite hard. That's quite difficult. The easiest way to develop boat speed is to train with, two, with another training partner. So there's two of you. And um, the ideal thing is to have one boat stay constant, at least for a day, and the other boat make changes and uh, do a lot of straight lining and to communicate between the two boats what each change did for boat speed. Um, it helps to be using similar equipment or the same equipment, uh, IB sales. If you're using the same sales, it's much easier to communicate. To make this process even a little easier is to have a coach involved, but you know you don't always get that. Um, but a coach can do photographs to show you on the water the difference in the setup, so you can actually visual, both, both boats can visualize where one boat was going better than the other. What did the sails look like? Did they look different? Did they look the same? Um, so a coach can give you that and a coach can make comments uh, as you're doing this process. But it's a very lengthy process. We would spend uh, in, that, in that period, those four year periods, we'd spend about four hours or five hours on the water, which is longer than I recommend. It gets pretty, at the end of the day, you are, the time's not very valuable, you get tired. But we always had somebody from somewhere in the world come tune with us. We had two boats and we had guests come in. I would say 75% of the time we were sailing, there was another person, another 470 sailor from somewhere in the world uh, there with us. And so you would go all day and make a list. And if you don't have a coach, you have to make a list of all the changes and what they did. And then in a debrief after sailing, sit and talk about it. it. Takes probably to make a real change, it takes a couple days of doing this. You never get it done in one day. Um, and so you keep doing this process of slowly leapfrogging, getting the slow boat to equalize with the fast boat, then getting the fast boat faster, and then getting the slow boat up, up to pace. And it's a leapfrog process, and you just slowly get faster and faster and faster. And if you do it enough, you'll end up being as fast as anybody in the world. But it takes a lot of time. And I don't know of any other way of doing it. Um, you, you know, you start with the tuning guide for that class. And what you'll find is sailboats are sailboats. They're all relatively similar. Uh, the basic concepts are the same in every boat. There's just some minor differences class to class. So you start with the tuning guide, uh, most likely the sails you're using, 
Um, those are really good places to start. Both boats set up similar or the same as close to it as possible. Then you go out and make these small, in, small changes. Um, when we're doing straight line testing, we don't like to go straight line more than three or four minutes. If you can't see a difference in three or four minutes, there isn't a difference. If you go long enough, yeah, somebody's gonna win the test. But that doesn't tell you what boat's faster or slow. If you don't see it pretty soon, it isn't there. You call it even and do another test. Um, in light air, you have to set up pretty much bow to bow because the lured boat will always win if, the bow, if they're bow forward in light air. Heavy air, you can have the weather boat be back about 20% of the boat length bow to bow and always about two to three boat lengths apart spread. Any more than that, you're at the whim of the wind shifts. Uh, any less than that, the lured boat will always dominate. Um, you have to be very careful when you're doing this to be realistic, truthful. Everybody wants to win a test all the time, but the information that you uh, uh, share has to be, you have to trust each other, and you have to take into um, consideration the shifts in that run. Did you get lifted? Did you get headed? Was it uh, realistic? A coach can really help you with that because you can take bearings from bow to bow and it doesn't matter that you get lifted or headed, those bearings are still a sign of whether you're losing or winning. Um, so this is just a long, hard process, but the beauty of it is you're going sailing. It's really fun. You get to go sailing this whole time. You get to spend time on the water. The windier it is, the more fun it is, the less, you know, uh taxing it is light air tuning in five knots of wind is really not much fun and a pain but you find in light air the differences often are greater than they are in 10 to 12 or 15 then all of a sudden you get into 20 and then the differences get huge because it's technique and you, when you're tuning you're working on technique as much as you are on sail shape and rig tension and rig rig tuning technique becomes just as important and you're uh, sharing that information so this process just goes on and on and it's building. The most important concept is you stop this process when you get to a regatta. You don't continue the process. When you're at a regatta, you're trying to do the best you can. You're not trying to learn about tuning at that point. Your homework is, should be done and the regatta is a check in to see how well you did the, the, your homework. If you did your homework well, you're gonna do well. If you didn't do your homework well, you're not going to do well. Um, I, I, I have a book that I've been keeping. I've been doing this now for 60 years, a long time. I have a book that for the last probably 45 years I kept that every major regatta I went into, I would write before what I think I was going to get, write what place I got. And, you know, Let's say uh, I'm going to Worlds and I think, well, I've done my preparation, I've done really well, I'll be in the top five. I never write in the book I'm gonna win because too much, you know, there's too many circumstances that come in, you can't count on winning or got it. But if you've done your homework well, you should be able to plan on doing, um, being in the top five. Then I write next to that actually how I did. And this is a really good guide to tell me, was I prepared, had I done all my homework, and was I truthful in where I was? And uh, I recommend doing something like this. You don't have to write it down, but in your mind before you start a regatta, think where you, how much homework you've done and where you should be, and then see if you're actually there. You know, there's always circumstances, but if you sail a 10, 12 race regatta, all those breaks kind of even out. Generally, it all evens out in the end, especially if you don't let a bad break interfere with the, how you're going to do in the regatta but the test is the results of whether you've done your homework done your tuning properly the picture on the left is the girls uh I, did you talk to about the last race and the what happened after we've had different groups every week so okay we talk about it <laughs> well the picture this is so dear to my heart uh this is the hardest part as a coach um, 
So we raced the last race. We knew what we had to do. We had to win the race. That was, that was the only thing in our control was win the race. We were a number of points behind. We had to put, what, three places between, uh, as I remember. I think that was it. Um, four places between. Yes. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. So we finished the race. We know where they were. We know where we were. But that doesn't do it. It's how all the other boats did. Did they beat the other boats? Did the other boats beat them? We know where we were. Um, did, you know, what was the final score? And we were doing this, um, the two coaches sitting there were doing this in our head. And it's a lot of ramifications. It took us about four or five minutes to do it. We knew we'd got third in the regatta at that point. We knew we'd meddled. Um, and I have to say the girls are the only team, Olympic team, to medal in the last of this quad in a world. They are the bright spot right now. Um, so we had to figure all the things. And it took us like four or five minutes to do it. And we finally figured out we tied and won the trials. And uh, for all of us, probably the happiest day in our life. <laughs> so, but we had to be really sure. You know, the worst thing we could have done is gone to the girls and say, "Oh, you want you going to the games?" And then turn out we do, we weren't. So we had to be quite sure, and it took took a fair amount of math. Julie and I were sweating it. Did we get it right? <laughs> and uh, luckily, we did, and the girls did exactly what they had to do. Well, from good coaching. <laughs> well, yeah, we could not have done it without you, Dave. Uh, good sailing on your part. No, um, you know, as a team, I started with you, what, two years ago now, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And where you've come in two years is remarkable. That um, two years ago, yes, you're fantastic sailors, but we were struggling in the class. So, and now we're not struggling at all. And the breeze sailing has improved dramatically we were very average in the breeze and now we are uh, as it showed in the worlds in australia as good as anybody in the breeze and you know uh, a lot of teams were quite upset when the olympics were postponed for us it's a blessing it gives us one more year to only get better first everybody doing a first quad the postponement was uh such a good thing. Anybody doing a second or third quad, the postponement was a bad thing. They didn't need more time. They needed the regatta. For us, it will just get us better and better and better. Totally. Onwards and upwards. Absolutely. Dave, Dave, you have some questions that are kind of relevant to what you're chatting about. Okay. Um, these are sent in, sent in by Jill. No, oh, Jay Gill, sorry. By Jay Gill. So um, one question, first question is, is it possible excuse my typos, is it possible to go for the Olympics anymore without training full-time or essentially being professional? Uh, it's possible, but to medal, no. Uh, it's not possible to medal. The game has gotten too hard. The game is the hardest sailing game in the world, regardless of everything else. I've done two America's Cups. Olympics is a much harder thing than the uh, America's Cup. So no, it takes um, it, you know it takes the kind of dedication that's really full time. You can go to the games without that, but you won't medal. And rarely has anybody medaled in their first quad. You girls are going to be one of the exceptions, but it's very rare. It's usually a second or third quad uh, takes to medal, which is one of the problems with the U.S. program. Is rarely do we get people back for a second. Or third most of the programs are a single quad program and it doesn't lead to uh, medals. Yeah, so one other, a follow-up question I think to that um, also from Jay Gill is that it seems to me for the most part that the Europeans outside of New Zealand and Australia have come to dominate small boat sailing the last number of years now. What are you doing differently than they are so you can beat them? Haha. -ha. <laughs> Trying to beat them at their game, just work harder. Um, there is nothing magical about what they're doing. They grow up sailing. Uh, sailing in New Zealand is the number one sport. Maybe rugby, maybe, you know, 
maybe, but it's very much at the top. So truly the really good athletes go into it and um, they, you know, are uh, held in a high esteem in the country, but they train and they work hard and they're quite dedicated. Um, they are funded slightly better, but that's not, that's only a very small part of the answer. The answer is, is dedication and working hard. And what you girls are doing is going to catch them at their, same, at their game and beat them at their game. She left out the Brits, too, who actually have the best program right now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. But the same exact thing, full-time, working hard, organized, uh, not wasting time. Yeah, I'd say to that full-time professional question, in a year um, without a COVID-19 break and without injuries or anything, we're trying to achieve about 200 days on the water in the FX. And so that's our starting point. And, um, you know, Which then, is what a full-time job is. What a full-time job is 220. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, hey, we're now getting some questions about mental fitness. So um, Jay Gill asked, do you do any neurological training? And Rob Hudson asked, what are the key things you do for mental fitness to win? And that's a step answer. <laughs> it's yeah. ask, ask Dave. It's ask Dave, period. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you do? Um, well, I'm from a different period where we didn't have any professional help uh, mentally. Uh, actually, I'm from a period where we didn't even have much coaching, um, which is why I got into coaching. I saw that it needed that and got into coaching uh, for the 88 games and been coaching on Olympic level since 88. Um, what can you do? Well, Really, I'm gonna get. I'm gonna throw it right back at Steph. That she's, <laughs> she has some help that's been really, really helpful. I mean, it's been really good. So, I'm throwing it back to you, Steph. You, <laughs> okay. You know. Um. Yeah, I've, we we've um, been working quite closely with a sports psychologist. Um, and we don't actually we don't do any like special neurological training, but we do. You know, we do believe that mental fitness is as important as your physical fitness and um, understanding that it does, it takes reps to, to get better with it. Just like in the gym, you don't get stronger overnight. You have to put in the reps in order to become mentally stronger. And, you know, you have to, you have to have some big lows in order to, um, to have to find your resilience and um, in order to, you know, find the, the, um, yeah, to find those, me that mental toughness and, um, I think there's a lot of skills that you can develop, um, off the water. Um, some, some things are like meditation, um, is really good for being present. Um, so that can, you know, when you're out sailing, all you can do is focus on the now and the immediate things that you have to do. So, um, something that really helps with that is, is meditating and, um, you know, people do it different ways. Some people like to listen to an app, some people, you know, just like to sit and focus in silence, or you can do some visualization, um, any of those things to help you like really be present and focus on the now, I think um, is a really, really helpful tool. I'm a little more old world than that, being old. <laughs> um, there's some things I think that make you better. Uh, one is results, winning breeds winning. Doing well breeds doing well. So never go to regatta and think, well, I'm just working on something and I don't care what the results are. I don't believe in that. I believe the more, the better you do, the easier it becomes to do better. The other is, and we've, I've worked with the girls just a little bit on this, is taking the races and compartmentalize them. Taking the race a little piece at a little piece. Don't look at the race as a big item, as a whole race, but the start, the first three minutes of the race, the middle of the first weather leg, the top of the weather mark, leaving just take each part, and make it its own section and really concentrate and work just on that part and don't think beyond that. And I think that makes, uh, it makes you not get confused and it's easier to uh, do well, I think. 
Yeah, and I, 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 we definitely appreciated that um, perspective because I think it, it, it all kind of feels like the, the mindfulness and the compartmentalization and it all feels just like really being in the moment and focusing on what you have to do now and not thinking about like, oh, I'm in 15th, like how is that gonna affect my overall results type thing. Yeah, yeah and different things work for really different people. Like Steph and I, even on the same team, have different techniques that um, we respond well to. And so, like, I'll just offer up that my my mental toughness techniques are mostly revolve around uh, actively keeping my focus on positive things during the race and not allowing the my concern for our result to be a distraction um, and not allowing that to make me feel anxious and nervous and trying to channel that energy in a good way. So that takes a lot of like active concentrating and focusing on the small steps at hand, you know, the next tiny baby step you have to take, like, like Dave was talking about, like, what's the next one thing I have to do. Um, but also just acknowledging how often you drift into those negative thought patterns of, okay, if we don't win this race, we're not going to win the trials. You know, that's a distracting negative thought pattern. And then you have to develop your own techniques for what helps you stop that and focus on the task at hand. So, um, Steph and I have talked in the past about visualizing a stop sign, you know, um, whatever works for you, saying stop and think about something else, you know, there, there are a million um, techniques for that. But uh, I think everyone, the time that they find most distressing is different. You know, some people get nervous the night before, some people get nervous the morning of, some people get nervous when they're racing. Um, and, and you just have to figure out what sort of mechanisms you use at those different times that help you focus on what you need to do. And that's a hard part of coaching is not to interfere with that. You can't, as a coach, put your values or your systems on the people you're coaching. You can make suggestions, but you have to let them do what they do to, to, you know, to have the best results. The way they handle pressure, any, any, you know, during the regatta, between regattas, whatever, during the race, and not interfere with that. And that's hard as a coach. <laughs> You do, do tell me to put my checklists down and get inside when it's too hot, though, and I'm going over and over and over on the boat. <laughs> well, I and see you, you do tell to sometimes. Go over. <laughs> Gotta stop yeah, that process. <laughs> sometimes they can become a little compulsive, but yeah, you know, Steph likes to go yeah. golfing, you know, and I would say our coaches encourage that. <laughs> yeah, well, absolutely. And the team environment really helps to reset and get everyone on the same page. Yeah. Well, everybody has to like everybody else on the team and appreciate them that we do <laughs> indeed we're very lucky all right um, who, has, who has more boat speed questions for, for dave we yeah. have one from from jude here um is it a good idea to scallop an x boat um <laughs> uh, I've done two blue chips and I don't know the answer to that, but my guess is if speaking without any knowledge, <laughs> no, because the blades are so bad. My guess is the blades, the center boards want to stall really easily. So you want to minimize the change in direction, but boy, that's shooting from the hip. <laughs> Jude likes to get us with the expo questions. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, okay, I'll answer Rob Hudson. Uh, what do you do for hull prep? Um, we clean the hull uh, with an eco-friendly soap and water, and then we dry it off. And then once before every regatta and probably every few weeks of training, we use McLube hull coat, put that on, take it off. Um, been using that forever, and McLube is a very generous sponsor of the U.S. sailing team. Um, and that's basically all we do to prep our hull. Uh, but we've got a long checklist for, you know, the boat work we have to do before every regatta. We have a checklist for what well, we have to check on the mast and the, and the rigging to make sure that everything looks good and nothing needs to be replaced, um, that all the preven preventative maintenance is done. Um, and that's about it. Then we measure everything in. Basically, Steph has to write down all of our serial numbers and stickers and everything, and that's no fun. <laughs> so that's our boat prep. <laughs> Not too complicated. Dave, you have a different process than that? Well, it depends on the class. Uh, you're sailing in a class that doesn't let you do anything to the boat, basically. You just have to make <laughs> yeah, sure, sure that everything's working. They don't let you fare. They don't let you sand. Uh, 
classes that let you fare the bottom is pretty mandatory that the bottom is absolutely as fair within the class rules as possible. Uh, prepping is pretty much the same. You put some type of Teflon uh, on the bottom and get rid of it. And it doesn't actually make the boat go through the water any faster. What it does is keep the hull clean when it's in the water. Uh, all our testing shows the Teflon bottom doesn't actually uh, isn't a faster surface, but a clean surface is much faster than a dirty surface. So on the way out to the race course or whatever, if you pick up any dirt on the bottom, that's considerably slow and the Teflon will allow, that, keeps that from happening. Uh, so that's pretty standard preparation is some type of Teflon preparation on the bottom. Um, oh, Dave, I have a question. The reality is, okay, uh, but when we've done really, really extensive testing, a wet and dry sanding is the fastest surface there is. Like an 800 sanding on the bottom is faster than a Teflon on the bottom. But and it doesn't take clean. Yeah, just to be totally clear, we do not sand our boat bottom because it's, it's uh, illegal. illegal. Yeah, yeah, so Rob's asking it's fair, fair, flat, smooth, and, and you mean by fair, totally flat here, or maybe explain what you mean by Well, that. the classes like Etchell's and classes like that that let you actually professionally fair the bottom uh, that is obviously the best, a uh, consistent shape, no hollows, no, you know, uh, whatever the water will go by the easiest, which would be a fair shape. Cool. Cool. And Dave, I've got one question for you. So salt water, there's a big debate about washing or wiping off, drying your boat every night when you're sitting in salt water. What do you think about Because after over time, if you don't wipe it, wipe it down, you get these little droplets like salt accumulation. Um, yeah, and, and those don't go away 100% when you go back in the water. Any uh, salt accumulation, any drying of salt uh, doesn't, you know, most of it will go away, but it doesn't all go away when you go back in the water. And obviously anything like that, any imperfection is dragged. So yes, cleaning the bottom, getting the bottom, uh, getting all the salt off the bottom is, you know, is preferable. I see you doing it, and, you know, I'd never stop you. <laughs> uh, we have a question. We have a question from Lucas, who is an Opti sailor. He's wondering, what is your favorite boat? Oh, oh in my lifetime, uh, when I was young, obviously 470s had some mm -hmm. success. Um, and then I would think in the last 20 years, Melch's 24s, which is, as a keelboat, as close to a planing dinghy as you can get. So those, those two. And I've done a lot of offshore racing, but I can't think of any of those that, that I really enjoy with my favorites. Dave, between your two favorites, how many world championships did you win? Four. In the four, 470 and Melch's 24? Uh, three in the four, 470 and one in the middle, just 24. Awesome. Bravo. <laughs> yeah. Um, Got lucky. A couple, couple more questions coming in here. One from Margo. Um, after college sailing, what boats or events do you recommend to try to get a foot in the door into professional sailing? Oh, Margo, you really want to be a professional sailor? You really want <laughs> poverty and you want to work a lot of days? <laughs> Um, but if the answer is yes, okay. Um, well, initially to be a professional sailor, um, you want to crew for the very best people you can. And, uh, both these girls sailed with extraordinarily good professional sailors. And that's the foundation is to see how really good pros do it and to be able to emulate what they do and uh, see the work ethic that they have. Then after that, um, if you look at most pro sailing now, very little of it is driving. It's all uh, crewing for owner drivers. So you have to get extraordinarily good at whatever job you do. And that doesn't always have to be a tactician, be a trimmer, be a bow person, uh, but you have to get very, very efficient and um, good at that specific job. 
and then sail with all the best people you can. If you look around, there is very few people on the professional side that actually drive boats. I can't even think of a hand. I can think of a handful. They're all techs, trimmers, people like that. So you have to be willing to do that too, if you want to be able to not do your yeah. own project. This is a constant battle I have. Whoa. Uh, I'm gonna have to plug in. But it's a constant battle I have whether I want to do my own project or not. As a pro sailor, you don't do your own project. Yeah. Let me get, I gotta plug in. So excuse me for <laughs> one minute. Keep going. All right. Um, well, we have a couple of questions from Gary here. Um, we'll start with the sailing one first. Um, like most sailing books state, do you actually, actually, we'll let that one go to Dave because ask yeah. Dave time. Uh, I'm back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but another one from Gary, how many sit-ups do you do a day and any one big workout that helps you the most on the water? Maggie? <laughs> do that, do that one again. I'm sorry. How many <laughs> sit-ups do you do a day, Dave? How many sit-ups do I do? Oh, now or when I was in good shape? Uh, oh. <laughs> we used to, um, when I was doing Olympic program, we would spend uh, an hour to an hour and a half in the gym every other day. Um, and then in between, just sail. But it was also a period where physical fitness wasn't emphasized like it is now. Um, it's one of the ways you could be better than the boat next to you. You'd be in better physical shape and work harder. You know, it's not just working on the sailing part, but working on uh, your physical condition. It doesn't uh, always translate in being stronger. It means that your conditioning is better, and by the end of the race, you're still thinking 100% clear. The better shape you're in, the better you do as the day goes on. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That's a good point. Cool. And then we have an, a sailing question from Gary. Um, like most sailing books state, do you actually let let out on the main sheet and hike second? And how much do you let out on the main? Of course, depending on the wind and boats around you. Hike first, let the main out second. Yeah, and then how, how much would you let the main out? Whatever it takes to keep the boat flat or whatever angle you want to sail on. You know, scow, you heel it over, but you heel it over next amount. So you only let it out that that amount. And you don't just let it out rapidly. You let it out the slowest you can to maintain what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. You don't there's just a, pop. There's something that um, always has stuck with me. I, I read um, Buddy Melgus' book, um, Sailing Smart, or Sailing Smarts. Um, and he talks a lot about um, just having a, con a consistent angle of heel or um, and the, the less that changes, the less disruption you have in the water. Um, and something that's really um, valuable in lake sailing is being able to line up the force stay with the horizon and then just keeping that the force stay really um, at a constant angle. Um, that's, what you're, that's what you're aiming for when you're doing this depowering system. Uh, and the other thing that I think is really helpful is to count, count into the pressure as well. So you don't get like hit by the puff and it surprises you and then you have to ease out that you keep in order to keep the boat tracking really at a good angle is that you're okay you're counting down into the puff and you're saying okay puff building in five two one your you're height you're already hiking going into it and then you're easing out based on the, the amount of deep power that you need to have yeah boats and, like to have stability which means not healing same amount of heel and Angle of attack of the sails always basically the same, which means slowly changing your uh, direction that you're steering to anticipate a uh, change in the wind puffs or directional changes. You don't want to be caught behind. You always want to be anticipating. And that yeah. goes for heel and sails, you know, and the wind. Buddy's a huge proponent of angle of attack of the sails keeping that constant. Yeah. Good book. And I just want to add one little rule of thumb for Gary that we think about a lot on our boat is that um, I trim the main sheet. And so if we're not fully hiking or fully trapezing and I'm easing the main, then we're doing something wrong. So 
I don't want to be easing the main until we're fully hiking. Um, and then I, I was wondering if this question actually pertains specifically to like the ease hike trim method, you know, of like laser sailing maybe. Um, and maybe, but I don't even think laser sailing. I think hike on every boat should be the first thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hike ease. Just hike always. <laughs> yeah, I, hike always. Yeah, I mean it's <laughs> right. you know if you want to keep maximum power and you want to keep the boat steady, first thing you do is hike. Totally. Well, who else has questions for for Dave? <laughs> We have a lot of Opti sailors um, on, and youth sailors on with us tonight, which is cool. Um, you have any advice for Opti sailors or anyone, you know, actually one, one girl um, from California as well. Um, what, what's your advice for any, for youth sailors? For youth sailors? Yeah. Um, boy, I'm gonna get in such, so much trouble here. Um, I am not a, overall huge fan for high school and college sailing and i'm going to get in trouble i'm already <laughs> in trouble um the boats you sail in those are such low performance not much fun to sail and don't require tuning so yes you're going to sail when you're in high school yes you're going to sail in college you're going to sail in high school because it's a way to get in college you're going to sail in college because that's why one of the reasons you're there but also sail something that's high performance. I love 29ers. Um, they're really fun to sail. Um, um, you learn how to tune, you learn how to do uh, all the other things that require the boat speed is an important part. So I think do some sailing outside of, uh, sailing multiple classes I think is really good. And if it's crewing, crew, but sailing different boats is makes a huge foundation also pick your class by what is available in your area what's what is the best competition in the area what do you read about in magazines but what's going on in your neighborhood that's the best competition i'm also a big fan of sailing against adults when you can not just you sail um, when i was a kid i uh, when I was 13, I started sailing snipes, uh, and that was the class in the United States at that time. And it was almost all adults, and that really pulls you along and gets you uh, uh, better really fast. Now, you don't want to do that 100% because there's a whole social side to sailing. <laughs> that, you know, you want to do that too. Uh, but if you can do some sailing against adults in an adult class, that really is beneficial to your sailing ability. Cool. Um, two more questions pouring in here. One from Caroline. Um, what is some good advice for going into laser sailing? Oh, get fit. <laughs> Be ready to hike. <laughs> get ready to hike as long as you can. Um, sail a laser if the laser is active in your area, otherwise not. Uh, if you're looking at, uh, also be the right size. I've seen way too many people get into laser sailing that are too small. Annie. <laughs> <Me>. <laughs> yeah, Annie. Yeah. And it's just punishing and you don't learn that much. You just learn you're too light. Yeah. So uh, be the right size to start with and then do it if there is boats in your area to, to sail against. Otherwise, pick whatever the most competitive class, youth class is in your area. Cool. All right, Margo is coming in hot with some questions. I like it. Um, she asks, what is your best advice for sailing financially responsibly? Um, sailing is a super expensive sport. How do you cut down on costs like charters and regattas um, and charter fees? It's obnoxiously expensive. It's absurd. <laughs> uh, what is the best way? Um, depends on how old you are, but cheaper in charter fees, fees is to drive. Take your boat and drive. It's much cheaper uh, than chartering. Uh, you know, get your parents into it, <laughs> so they uh, they like it, and maybe we'll do some traveling with you. Um, 
it's there's no way around it um, and the higher the level gets the more expensive it is i mean these girls can give you an idea of what it costs uh, it's very 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 expensive um, but sailing locally isn't the the only the real cost is only um, the you know the boat and sails if, if if you sail locally you know you live at home and you drive your car with the, with the boat to where you're going to sail and maybe you drive home every night and stay home and you can do it on a pretty tight budget yeah i think too there's there's a lot of organizations that have um grants that you can apply for as well um and margo you can definitely reach out to us on the side and we can talk to you some more about um, putting a budget together and, and um, putting reaching out to um, foundations for support as well yeah and i would also say like putting in a, a, a big emphasis on training at home and training locally and picking and choosing which regattas you do because i think there's a lot of pressure to go do every single regatta and it's actually totally unnecessary and a lot of cost and you lose a lot of time shuffling around um and so that's one way to cut your budget down a lot is to just focus on training more and then you know uh work towards specific regattas and and um kind of pick and choose those wisely also boat maintenance or you know equipment care i think people uh lose a lot of money because they don't know how to take care of their equipment um certainly you can destroy sails you can ruin your boat and, and problems just snowball if you don't take good care of it. And so that's, that's kind of a good thing to learn about too, when you do, if you buy a used boat or if you, you know, uh, when you get a, a new boat and, and yeah, just taking really good care of it will make everything last a lot longer. Maggie's a master of that. So if you need some advice, definitely reach out to her for that. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> cool. What are some good boats for small people? Oh, well uh, to drive. 29er. 29. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, um, well, obviously in high school, uh, to drive you, you know, drivers should be quite small, um, you know, and then it's, and also small crews in the boats, you know, high school and college. That there's a huge premium on small, small, really good crews, um, heavy air crews. Um, what else would obviously opties you know if you're young um so i think that it's given that you're the opti it's as good to, it's good to get out of that uh at a fairly early age i don't think you should be sailing opties when you're 17 years old or whatever yeah okay. yeah yep um I'm, I'm a if you're small I think, say the opti. <laughs> yeah yeah i think 29ers are a really good step into performance sales and you can be small and drive and you have to be pretty nice to crew so there's some very specific uh, sizes and accomplish either one can book but a boat like that the crew is as important or more important in this case. yeah so that's you know it's and so are the skiffs you know the crew is just crucial to winning huge uh, you know it's really really important in the crew so it's it's a big benefit being a really good crew so i think yeah i think as a youth boat uh 29 is superb cool yeah get into the skiff world <laughs> yeah exactly I mean, it is it is the happening thing and it and it's more fun I, I, my son who is quite good sailor professional sailor when he was in high school uh was they were sailing fjs and he came to me one day and said i'm gonna quit and he was, you know, the A, a person on his team. Um, he said, I'm gonna quit. And I said, well, Charlie, when are you gonna, why are you gonna quit? Said, well, this is really not much fun to sail these boats. I said, well, what would it take to keep you from quitting? He said, if I had a 29er and raced a 29er, I would still keep, do high school sailing as a member of the team. And then he got second that year in the North Americans in 29ers, yeah. So there's a fun factor that the boat has to supply. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Well, we haven't had any more questions pour in, but um, anyone who has a question after the fact, feel free to reach out to us or Dave. Um, we're always here to, to help and answer any questions you guys might have. 
Um, but we really appreciate you all tuning in tonight for our last webinar. It's pretty sad to think we've already done <laughs> the whole webinar series. Time flies and you're having fun. Um, but we want to give a huge shout out to Dave for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. Um, we love having you on our team and um, looking forward to the next year together. And uh, really big shout out and thank you to IOYA and Sales Inc. for making this happen. It's been a lot of fun. So thank you very much, guys. Thank you all. Thank you, girls. It's been a real pleasure working with you. And at some point, I want to go, come to the Yacht Club. Absolutely. We can yeah, definitely yeah. make that happen. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, how lucky were we to have Dave Altman sharing his experiences and go fast tips. We will all benefit from your expertise. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you, Maggie and Steph, for your great webinar series. We will all sail better and faster because of your shared knowledge. We're so proud to call you our own, and we wish you a great showing at the Tokyo Olympics in 2021. Thank you to the participants, the sponsors, the organizers, and the prevent and presenters. You have provided an educational source that we can all revisit many, many times. Viewers, your participation and interaction was fantastic. We really love the format. So thank you again, and we'll see you on the water.